Welcome to Show Studio, it's Paris Fashion Week and we're going to be talking about the Marge de Show which is going to give us a lot to unpick and dissect because I think even though Galliano has kind of done a few presentations now, I think people are still really excited to see kind of how that story and narrative develops. Um, I've got an amazing set of panellists with me to help unpick sort of what's been going on in Paris so far and what we think of the new identity of the health of Margiela. But before we kind of dive in, I'll let you guys just introduce yourself, starting with you, Mima. Good morning, I'm Mima Viglezio. I'm a creative consultant and the editor-in-chief of Lula magazine. Hi, I'm Lucy Moore, owner of Cladderon Books. Hi, I'm Marion Hume. I'm the international fashion editor of the Australian Financial Review. You're so good at introducing yourself. I always think that whenever you're on the panels, you're very like good at it. I would mumble when I begin. We prepare, you know, we <laughs> rehearse. In front you do, of the in front of the mirror, like, <laughs> a moment to shine. Um, so as I said, I want to start by talking about um, John Galliano's tenure there so far. And I just want to kind of throw it open. What does everyone think about what we've seen at Margiela so far? Do we like what we're seeing? What do we think? Is there a new identity there, do we think? Or is it kind of slow steps? What, what's been going on? What's fascinated us all about, about what's happened there so far? <laughs> From what, I'm, what I've seen this morning, actually, on Mima's phone, um, <laughs> it, feels, it feels very Galliano to me. Yeah. So, you know, I'm waiting to see more, so I'm, I'm not talking from a position of strength on this show, but it, if I had to say, you know, is this Margiela or is this Galliano? I'm a real Galliano fan. I'm, yeah. I, I must out myself right straight away as that and mm. have known him right since the very beginning. And I just feel great, sort of wonderful passion seeing him fly again. Mm. So I'm, I'm just going to say I'm, I'm very biased. Mm. Do you think what he's done from the first collection he did for them, which was the Couture, do you think that felt very Galliano? Do you think it's got more Galliano as he's been um, there longer? I don't think it was what any of us would have anticipated he might do. You know, when it was announced that he was going to Margiela, and obviously Margiela has such a, such a sort of strong brand identity for a label that has always tried not to be a brand. Mm -hmm. um, I guess we were all very excited, we anticipated certain things, and he did absolutely none of them, mm. which made it all the more marvellous. And that first couture show, I mean, I, I just thought it was heavenly, and I've really enjoyed at seeing people wearing bits of it, you know, mm. not obviously the face masks, which mm. would have been a bit peculiar in real life, but <laughs> it, was very it was very exciting, and it's continued to be very exciting to me. Mm. What's your take on it, Lucy? I also... I'm a adore Galliano <laughs> <laughs> um, and Margiela too um, and I think yeah I've also loved um, the collection so far uh, I I think yeah there's been sort of there have been different opinions about whether or not about kind of the coming together of these two of this great designer and this great house um, and I to me it makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. um, Having said that, I'm kind of I'm interested in whether he, whether Galliano can will will continue to find kind of I, I think I think the initial meeting makes a lot of sense, and then yeah. I'm really curious to see whether he can continue to find space within within the house to kind of um, pursue his own um, creative direction. So, but it does, yeah. I think there are a lot of common kind of there's a common origin for both both. Tell me, tell me more what you mean by that. To do with sort of, yeah, kind of a punk, a kind of post-punk um, kind of DIY um, kind of aesthetic. Uh, and then also, I think, Margiela, whilst kind of lesser, I think people slightly f forgot, but, you know, Margiela's was um, at the outset really ro kind of romantic and poetic and um, kind of... Uh, kind of devil may care and um, and sort of Im and very imaginative and I think mm -hmm. it's just that Galli and Galliano obviously has always been that too and they they just express those those kind of impulses have been expressed in different ways through mm -hmm. the clothes but I think that the kind of this kind of real fantasy and humor and theatricality mm -hmm. is shared by both. It's interesting you talk about kind of yeah the humor and theatricality because I think people, a lot of the younger generation perhaps associate Margiela with minimalism, which I don't think necessarily is Margiela in a lot of people's minds. You know, if you look exactly. at the early shows and the use of reappropriated like pieces, whether it was often quite ornate pieces, and I think that's really interesting, but those parallels, 
we were talking on a panel yesterday about how kind of the history of brands or designers can get rewritten because of the internet and the shows that you can see on the internet mm-hmm. and the shows that you can't. And I wonder if that's part of the problem with Margella is the later collections and the kind of whitewashing is seen as very much the identity of the brand. What do you think about it all? I mean, you're staying uncharacteristically quiet. No, because I, I wait to be asked. <laughs> um, it's right. First, yeah, no, I think, I think you're, both of you are very right. I don't see Marcella as a minimalistic brand, especially because of the strong identity. Marion said, try not to be a brand, but then the identity of Margiela is much stronger than many brands that you would never recognize. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the same goes for Galliano. So I couldn't agree more. I also think when you said, what do you think of his tenure so far, is that I thought he started in a shy way, trying not to be too much Galliano and trying to, you know, bow to the Margiela heritage. But then also I think he was shy because it was his first public outing in Couture Mm -hmm. that he did it in London after all the brouha that happened around him. So, you know, I mean. Yeah. Um, and now, the little I've seen on Periscope this morning of the show that we will see in a second, he is bursting up and young. Mm. I mean, he couldn't yeah. keep it any longer, and you will see there is so much of him coming back. Do you know back. if they ever met? As in the, Martin? I think he said yeah. he did, yeah. right? They, they, they had a lunch, didn't they? Yeah, they had one was appointed, yeah, which is interesting. But also, to go back to that, and, 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 and it's the fact that I think when. when uh, the, the Renzo Rosso chose him, mm. I thought it was genius because of the strong identities, you yeah. know, because Margiela was a white canvas that could accept mm. anything and could accept Galliano. So I was one of those saying, no, this is genius. He's not just a celebrity hiring to make them talk about themselves. It's a, it's the right choice. But I think people confuse identity and branding. And I think because Galliano has such a strong identity, there's this sense that Margiela should be kind of nameless and, I, and sort of you know, unbranded yeah. and I think that's what's really difficult it's kind of what yeah what does identity with it because as we all kind of said you know Marcel I think does have an incredibly strong kind of brand ethos and sense of branding around it even though it's not there's, there's that kind of label yeah. this nameless thing and I think that's really subtle and quite difficult when you try and bring in someone new to kind of slot them into that I don't know I always wonder if you could have built Margiela in the way that it was built at the time, if you could even do that now, you know, whether it's with someone being secret, yeah, it exactly. would be impossible, wouldn't it, yeah. in the I age of the so. internet? Because someone would, he would almost be hunted down. And the um, what was so glorious about him and Margiela, I'm talking about in the early days, was there was this sense that we, those of us that were seeing those early shows, that we did meet him, but we didn't know it was him. We sort of mm-hmm. half mm. thought that it might be him. I mean, he's not, sat next to you. Um, he's not some kind of, or as far as I remember, some kind of, you know, crazy Howard Hughes recluse. <laughs> no, there no. isn't any kind of madness of I hate people. It was a yeah. choice of, I just don't want to engage in this. And the other, he wasn't the only one. I mean, people like Romeo Gigli was exactly. very, was yeah, he was okay. very, very shy, but not in person, not one on one. He yeah. was completely an engaged and normal convivial human being but I was thinking though just before of this this notion that you know a man that we never we've never really seen and how his brand is now being designed by a man who doesn't own his own name there's this sort of strange thing of that coming together yeah it is very strange I think that yeah I think there's a kind of there is this certain irony to it as well but I wonder I don't know I just wonder with that kind of nameless thing, if that's something that's, that is kind of returning to fashion in a way, that idea of being a bit anonymous and being removed from the kind of the conversation. I think you see it with a lot of designers, n- nowhere near to the degree that Marcella did, but trying to establish that around themselves. Like, you know, Celine's quite a good example of being very lofty about their online presence and it's quite hard to get access to Phoebe Filo. And I think that's, I, I think that's quite interesting, that kind of mass communication doesn't feel that on one hand it's so essential to building a brand but it doesn't feel that luxurious but I wonder if there is more of an interesting kind of it doesn't really happen that much I think Phoebe Philo is an exception I don't Mm. I mean I think there is still very much this stardom thing Mm. around Mm. designers you know I I was thinking about Phoebe Philo doesn't have mystique does she it's just 
it's she's simply unavailable to mm. most of us. That I don't think it's a mysterious no, thing. No, you're right. We just yeah, know it's not that, that, you know, she doesn't do interviews it. and they don't want to sell on the internet, but the, the yeah. product is widely available. The product is all over the yeah. internet. So and she maybe. is also, you know, she took part in the Vogue Fashion Festival, didn't she? Yeah, yeah. You know, she, says, she yeah. she's not reclusive we or know invisible. Her face. Yeah, we yeah. know her or we feel that we know her. Yeah. But I wanted to say something about the, 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 the diva and stardom of uh, one thing that makes me laugh is when they talk about like unknown designer when they mention Alessandro Michele, like, you know, oh that was so brave to take someone unknown. I mean the guy is forty years old, he's worked in fashion for twenty years, been in Gucci for ten years. He was just not the face of it, but it was unknown to the masses, but yeah. it wasn't like hiring someone from the street. So and, and there's, because there's this thing around the people that become stars and they're followed by paparazzi and they, you know, and uh, it's so annoying. Yeah. I don't know if you see what well, I mean. Well, the cult of them yeah, being yeah, celebrities is relatively new. And I mean, it's timely now that we, you know, we heard yesterday that Ralph Lauren, one of the most famous brands and Step men down. in fashion has stepped back as CEO. Mm -hmm. But uh, his generation is really the first where they became superstars. You mm. know, Ralph, Donna and Calvin were mm. superstars, but the people before them really weren't. Mm. So it's only in that frame of time, which is actually well, it's now, quite a long frame of time. But it's now it's, years, it's, it's more than ever. And yeah. that's what, when, I when they it's say- it's more than ever, it's just more visible than ever because of social media. You think if yeah, Ralph right. had, had an Instagram account back there, he would have felt so just the same. It's just so much more kind of pervasive. Yeah, now. but it's more than ever because everybody in the street knows who Ricardo is, mm. as in mm. Tishi for Givenchy. Mm. Givenchy, why? While 20 years ago, if someone wasn't in fashion, you couldn't say Ricardo and people would say Tishi Givenchy. So mm. yes, it is because of the internet, but, mm. but the thing is that they think it's brave to hire someone whose name is not known. And I think it's about the experience. It's not about mm. the celebrity around the people. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. It also makes business sense, doesn't it? I mean, it's not as if the Gucci move was unprecedented. You know, Sarah yeah. Burton was really the one that yeah. we didn't know her. Mm. We, we, we didn't, you know, we knew that there was this girl at Alexander McQueen, but well, how much Janine, bigger think. could that mm. success have been? Yeah. Yeah. Frida is slightly, you know, perhaps a different arc of success, but the pair at Valentino. Yeah, the I Valentino mean, now if I was a CEO, yeah. I'd definitely be looking around the corner to see, you know, who was on the yeah. design desk. Rather but, even, than but even Ricardo Tisci was an unknown mm. before becoming Givenchy. Now he's a celebrity. Everybody starts so, somewhere where you're not known. Mm. Alessandro Michele is now a star. Yeah. In, one collection. You know, in but then that's years. what's difficult with my gender because it's like if they just appointed someone who was working within the team already, which is kind of what was they did for a which while. Was what it was didn't happening work. before? Well, I think it did work. It just you ca you can't spin a press story out of that. Do you know what I mean? Like it's just business as usual, collections as usual. And I thought the collections were really, really beautiful, particularly the Artisanal ones were so amazing. Yeah, but they so never said their names because the exactly. Valentino duo would have been the same, except that they elevated them to yeah. or, or Alessandro but, then it's like, what but at Margiela the they kept them quiet yeah but maybe what would have been the point to tell their name maybe yeah. the interesting question is if Galliano wasn't there for the for a new you know position would they have chosen another well-known designer exactly, that's or what not because I, mean. yes, I think the choice of Galliano is very specific and makes a lot of sense yeah. to the to the to the brand yeah. um, it makes a lot of business sense um, without compromising the identity mm. yeah the, the identity of Margiela so so I kind of wonder whether yeah, yeah. Cause Cause it yeah. Doesn't feel I like think that Galliano was a specific choice mm. not mm. just because it was available mm. it's exactly. also very Re Renzo you know the yeah. owner of the company yeah. you know his company only the brave you know so for him to make what mm. was seen as a very brave decision yeah um, that it fitted, didn't it? It all fitted together nicely to get yeah. Galliano. And you know, at the time, remember, we were because there were all these whispers that he was going to Oscar de la Renta. Yeah, yeah. Know, yeah. completely yeah. different. Yeah. And, think, and that seemed I very believable, though. I, thought, I would have thought wrong. Then yeah. we haven't seen, but I was like, no. <laughs> I think that he did get offered Oscar de la Renta, I think, but there was like issues over him taking his team, and yeah. Oscar de la Renta's team were really yeah. happy. So but so he was like, offered the job? I believe so. And th well, that's what we heard, yes, but I, I don't think, I don't see Galliano and Oscar. I don't know, I, I think it would just be a very different, different thing. Yeah. I think it would be very, 
it would just be different stories because he's a designer that's all about stories and I think there's certain stories that work well for my gender but there's certain stories that would have worked well at Oscar de la Renta. I think it was Alex Pure actually that wrote a piece when Galliano did his first Kitchener collection where Alex worked out how many collections Galliano would have done if he hadn't been fired from Dior and it was something crazy, it was like 48 or something. I think that's 48 stories, so you, you probably think wherever he goes there would have been little fantasies and tales he had in his head that would have worked. So I think it's he just shapes them in a different way. Yeah, I'm thinking more about the, the, the typical client of Oscar, you know, the Park Avenue, very rich lady who goes mm. to the theatre and to the opera, or to the fundraiser. I mean, Galliano's story can be outrageous and those women are not outrageous, mm. but I don't know, yeah, we don't know, so we can't mm. speculate on something that actually didn't happen, but um, I, I think, think it's genius to mm. put him into <laughs> Margiela Brand. I think it's a very good choice. I do think Lucy's point was really interesting, is like whether they would have announced any designer at all, whether it felt like they were looking to kind of like make an appointment or whether it just felt like Galliano was available and that felt right, because it doesn't feel like they suddenly would have been like, oh, this is the name of the person designing it just FYI, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that would have been really strange. Mm. But I'm interested, just before we have a look at the collection, I, I want to talk about um, some of the kind of codes of Margiela, I hate that word, it's such a cliche, um, but kind of some of the tropes that we associate with Margiela and the sort of DNA of the brand to go through a load of fashion cliches there. Um, and a lot of that focuses on kind of, you know, this idea of reappropriation, recycling and deconstruction. And I'm interested in just, I think those, themes should be more pertinent than ever because of this kind of like you know, magpie mentality that people have partly because of the internet and kind of Tumblr culture of assembling different things from different sources and referencing but how those things still feel relevant because it's, it's strange to think how revolutionary they were at the time because now they're concepts that just kind of completely run through all of fashion so I'm just interested in everyone's take on that. There's lots of questions wrapped up in... There's a historical there. thing, though, isn't there, in that, that when um, Margiela was beginning and the same time that John was beginning, you could go to flea markets and find fabulous things mm. for not very much money. And now there is this massive business of people finding fabulous things and selling them for more money, mm. whether it's you know people that do it professionally or people that do it almost professionally through eBay. So if you decided that you wanted to kind of re-mint Margiela in the way it was done, it would be incredibly difficult and mm. really rather expensive. So yeah. that idea of kind of going to markets and as he did and finding, you know, I'm thinking of the scarf collection, which was all yeah. those brilliant scarves. And I know at, you know, at that time, um, I was, I guess, in my mid-twenties and loved all that. And I was like, oh, I'm going to go to Paris and find all these scarves. And of course, there was absolutely nothing. <laughs> and, you know, I was just like one step, always one step behind and yeah. all that stuff was, was gone. So to appropriate the way he did and others at that time are doing wouldn't be possible now, would it? Or it would be yeah. a lot more self-conscious, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I was thinking, I wanted to sort of ask about this because we talked about this a lot on the Gucci panel, but um, McKelly kind of referred to what he does as fake vintage. And it got me thinking about that in relation to Margiela and in relation to this idea of kind of like, yeah, recycling things. And what's the difference between is recycling the same when it's taking in a garment and replicating it? Or what, you know, where, where do those lines blur in terms of like, you know, repositioning vintage or bringing things in or taking different influences. It's an interesting one. The compare, I think the comparison with Gucci is, is, is really a good one because when we were talking about Gucci, I think it felt so kind of wonderful in terms of branding because, because this kind of sense that you could maybe have one piece from the collection and then bring together lots of other pieces that might be not necessarily just from a vintage shop but it might just be something you bought in Gap or something <laughs> <laughs> that that's really liberating and powerful and wonderful for people um, for the consumer but I think what's different about um, perhaps Galliano coming to Margiela is that the emphasis is still on the aesthetic of reconstruction or deconstruction but it's the emphasis is on you know Galliano is is a t like a master tailor and mm. that's his that's his kind of history and that's how that's his identity and so rather than it being something to do with styling where you just take you you know you bring different types of pieces together and create something incredible it's much more a kind of um, to do with this kind of high art of tailoring to make something look deconstructed which mm. is like very different yeah, and, and also really like cool. an evolution for for Margiela as well mm. in, a, in a way 
It's less about kind of found stuff. And more, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That is interesting. It's interesting because I am, um, because obviously MM6 had their show in London um, this time, and they did a really great show. And it was interesting because they used a lot of kind of found um, pieces within it, but they talked a lot about wanting to have that kind of Margiela ethos in there but not wanting it to be kind of historical or kind of lofty vintage pieces. It wasn't about antiques, it was kind of about like throwaway stuff. So a lot of it was kind of like really bad old mm. t-shirts that they kind of reappropriated. And I thought that was quite interesting just in terms of like, because I think it does tie into what you were saying, that it is just really, really hard to access those pieces. You know, in before Galliano joined um, in one of the artisanal collections, they had like an old um, like, papyri, like jet, um, coat that they'd, um, sort of t turned into a garment and you think you can't really access those things anymore unless you go to um, incredible auction houses it's not like you can just walk into a flea market and get really great stuff so it's like people are having to think about recycling or deconstruction in a very different way and it becomes about cut and fit which is it yeah it's interesting but where John's like actually very he is actually very good at that and I'm thinking of a specific example of watching him go and to some really tacky place <laughs> and he found this sweatshirt and it was I remember like I was making a documentary on him, which is why I was there, but seeing him pick up this sweatshirt and it was a revolting colour, a kind of queen mum mauve colour. <laughs> and on the front was a like a horse off a carousel, you know, a fairground carousel. And he held it up and I thought he was going to make some, you know, horrible face of, oh, isn't this thing vile? <laughs> and instead he was like, buy it, buy it, buy it. And they bought this sweatshirt and then we followed the course of what happened to this sweatshirt. It inspired a dress, a completely full sequin dress with a horse coming off the shoulder that, you know, Nadia Auerman wore looking kind of statuesque and beaded. Mm -hmm. It came from this revolting thing that, I mean, if you'd seen it in a jumble sale, you'd have gone, you know what, that's actually, I think I'll let that one go. And it's <laughs> a 5 bet, I bet the but his between <laughs> copying some, something or taking it and making it looking new or having a vision in a piece of junk that mm. probably we wouldn't have even noticed and make it into something spectacular so mm. I don't think I don't think yeah I think it means they construct in a way not even vintage just something old and, mm. and mm. meaningless and making it meaningful mm. right but he t but then if you think like everyone made this comparison you think about the newspaper print and stuff like that I think that ethos runs through everything he does it doesn't have to be about yeah, it's just a gone. vision that he has by looking at something normal daily life you mm. know but um, I'm not sure that it's exactly what he's doing at Margiela now no I don't no. think he's doing it well we, it'd be interesting to see mm. what mm. we're going to see but I don't feel that he's doing the same mm. that he has having the same process mm -hmm. Mm. what do you think yeah I agree he's not instinctively doing that, is he? yeah I want to know, before we look at it, I want to know more about this documentary. When was this? <laughs> Sorry, mm. I'm just fascinated. It was, um, it was for the South Bank show when, yeah. um, on John Galliano. Is it online? Yeah. Can you see it? Do you know what? I don't know, but it's... Um, you should definitely upload it. It's, very, it's, it's really interesting. Yeah. Is it called John Galliano by Marion Hume? No, no, I, I didn't it. direct it. Um, I worked on it, but it was... Um, I was the, what was I, series researcher or something, can't remember. But it was that mo the transition moment between... Um, when he went to Givenchy, actually yeah. it was that moment when oh. he went from being, you know, a London yeah. reckless, wild child yeah. to going to Couture, which now is a transition that we've grown used to. You yeah, know, we've completely. seen, um, well, we've seen the whole arc, haven't we, yeah. from the beginning to the end, but then was was rather extraordinary. So, yeah. yes, please, please track it down. Yeah, that it's, sounds uh, amazing. It's, it's good. Should we look at the show from this season? This is autumn winter. Yeah. Time. So just to give a little um, little bit of background, I think the biggest themes is kind of lo-fi, sky-fi with a hi-fi finish. I don't yeah. understand those notes, but <laughs> maybe someone can translate yeah. for me. But they've <laughs> talked about, um, oh my God, yeah, this is... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's just let the clothes speak for themselves. Yeah. There's a serious lady bag there, isn't there? That's yeah, it, it, it looks like a Birkin yeah, bag. Kind of ironic know. Birkin in almost toothpaste white. Well, it's very lady lady, like the mm. whole. I look at the hair. The okay. hair's very yeah. prominent, isn't it? It's the so hair important is important for the silhouette, I think. I'm interested with the kind of futuristic-y thing that's going on because it's interesting that 
I think some of the criticism of the first show that was made was that it almost felt a little bit dated. And I think it's interesting because this is kind of like... Opposite. Well, it's, it's doing something that's very classic, you know, like number four is almost identical to number one in some way. So that, that kind of like quite 50 easy kind of coat and the hair, and it's very retro, but then it's almost quite spacey. Do you know what I mean? And I think that's quite mm. interesting. That hair number six, I remember a campaign he did with Giselle, one of the first campaign at Dior with Giselle, she was hair, her hair looked exactly like that. So it's mm. like it's and when you see it in number seven, when you see the same model from the back, that is, that's a serious bit of back comb. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's going yeah. <laughs> to have a head under the tap for ages getting rid of that. Um, and those beehives also, that's quite serious hair. I think the, um, I think number seven is a really interesting look because it's kind of like all this sense of like covering glamour in some ways, like it looks almost like you know, the embellishment's got that overlay over it and it's mm. almost, you know, everything's kind of disguised, nothing's mm. too obvious. Which was obvious. Prada did last week in yeah. London, you know, the yeah. suit were all covered like this. I love the big fishnets, it's so like... Yeah, yeah they're great. It's like improper, proper. Yeah, they're you know, very kind of, improper. Yeah. yeah. But again, he was the first one, probably, yeah. I remember again, we're talking 10, mm. 15 years ago, he was the first one to put fishnet on the on the catwalk and then fishnet became something yeah. so it's referencing himself mm. i like the lake oh that's a man number 10. i don't know if it's a man or a woman oh, look really at the know. boobs i mean <laughs> it's really inexistent <laughs> yeah that cannot be a woman i like that you don't really know i think that's probably the point that's the point but yeah. that's definitely a man right it's it does feel in counterpoint to the kind of 70s um the emphasis on the 70s that's kind of been yeah. seen in some of the other collections. This feels totally, it's kind of disregarding that completely. It's more 60s, 80s, yeah, exactly. Blade Runner, Futurism. Retro Futurism. Rogue Handicraft. <laughs> yes, ro yes, the Rogue Handicraft. <laughs> waiting to, what do you, that was your to run up and kind of mug that. someone. Of, it's, a, it's such a funny term. <laughs> it is a um, this press release is actually really marvellous, I think. <laughs> we ought it to share more of it, it was, really. It Do you want to read it out? Because I'm actually just I don't, I don't so think I, I can. I, I, think I'll, I think I'll laugh. I think Lucy's got the kind of the nicest, most mellow voice. Yeah, Lucy, and she does it. run a bookshop and therefore ought to be used to reading <laughs> out loud. Give us a reading. Oh, OK. Uh, I'll do the second, second part. In, in sheaths and shells of glistening filmic textile, spontaneous gestur gestures clasp and suspend, disrupting the free fall of drape and bonded structure. Outre intentions are planed with classical rigour as brutal sculptured forms confront the demure tropes of femininity. So you made it sound good actually, that was impressive. No, I mean, what is that? <laughs> exactly. <I don't> <laughs> but look at that, men are coming on and they're not very futuristic, I think mm. they look pretty vintage. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, think I like it's this idea of you know men. I know again, nothing new. I mean, Dolce Gabbana kind of probably started it, mm. didn't they? Sending women out in the men's shows, but it sort of makes sense. We all live our lives together. Yeah, um, and completely. why shouldn't you? We, we've discussed here before. Why shouldn't you, as a man, wear a dress? Yeah. Why shouldn't I, as a woman, wear trousers? So yeah. why not just mix the whole thing up? Yeah. I think it's also interesting because you think 13, sorry Brett, just to go back, 13, if that had been worn by the model before, like the model in number 12, sorry to go back again yeah. for Brett, um, it would have been a very different garment, that yeah. would have felt quite sensual, it would have been quite sexualising and I think... I think 12 is a man too, don't you think so? But that, no, 12, I think 12 is a girl, <laughs> but I don't think it really matters. Yeah, it doesn't matter, that's <laughs> like, the point. Let's move exactly. on from that. <laughs> but I think, you know, it's interesting, like 12, it's like almost like a cricket jumper and then... Yeah. 13, it's like a kind of like quite, you know, yes, look 70s, at me, it's almost jumpsuit. Halston, isn't it? That exactly. sort of sexy louche. But if you imagine um, if the two models had switched in those outfits, it would have felt like a very different look, and I think yeah. that's what's really interesting. And again, by shifting the body, our kind of expectations of, by, by kind of going against what we expect in terms of the body that wears the clothes, it, it kind of, it subtly highlights tailoring and, and 
the kind of technical expertise of, of the house. So mm -hmm. I think it's very clever. Yeah, because Even it removes that's the subtle, focus on the body. You're yeah. right. You don't like number thirteen. You look at the garment. You don't look so much at like mm -hmm. you know the chest and. I so the body's becoming a frame rather than a mm. person. Yeah, exactly. Which again is um, very much other. Very much other. So it's yeah. all very. I always coherent. love to see the same, like you see the same coat, the green jacket, uh, on a boy and a girl, but cut for a girl and cut for a boy, mm. and I think that's very interesting. Mm. You know these blurred lines between genders, but actually the garment is obviously for a girl and obviously yeah. for a man. I think the flat number fourteen. It looks like flat tabby boots. And that's really interesting because you know those Nike shoes that everyone wears that go yeah. between your toes. It's like a, it's you know it's like we did it first, but it's kind of updating them. I think they're really cool. Isn't aren't they a Margiela code to yeah, use your yeah yeah um, completely yeah to yeah. use those words we're not supposed to use but then it's like weird DNA because you think you see so many people wearing that the trainer be, yeah. ones and it's interesting to kind of like. When I think tabby boots, you always think of the high ones, you know, mm. the girls' ones. So it's interesting to see it flat. But it's funny how what we're seeing now, it's so different than the beginning of the collection. It's like yeah. a different collection mm. overall. So, and you'll see it's going to change again. Yeah. I think that's oh, so you've nice. had the preview. Yeah, You're ahead preview, of us. Because yeah. it's looking very 60s, isn't mm. it? Like that 60s bathing costume in the middle. Definitely a bathing costume as opposed to a swimsuit. Mm. Um, unless it's a little dress, it's sort of kind of hard, hard to see when you're... But, but what's with her, uh, her legs are kind of slicked. Is that the tights or mm. is that... Space. They're amazing. I think it's interesting about kind of taking these like tropes of feminine dressing, you know, like number 19, like it's quite a kind of a dated idea almost, you know, like mm. a retro coat with a leopard print collar and it's the same with the looks that opened it, you know, when you, it's like a kind of almost like a cartoon of a fashionable woman, you know, yeah. the coat with her statement handbag, and then kind of tweaking them and, and pulling at them. I think that's interesting. But what do we think these statement handbags are about? Because I can't think that it's as obvious commerce. as, you know, Margiela's just going, yeah, that was <laughs> it's commerce, yeah, of course. But business. usually when you see, you know, models hauling a huge bag down a catwalk, it's like, oh, well, here's the sales pitch. But yeah. do we think this might be a bit ironic? I mean, I think it's presented with irony. No, Mima think, doesn't. Mima's like. But I think it's nice. about commerce. I mean, they're not so great. Renzo's though, trying to make a buck. I was like, <laughs> Do you can like you please them? put some bags on the yeah. catwalk because that's all we sell. Yeah. No, yeah. I and now you'll see the geisha look. Yeah. They have little bags on the back, which is quite fun. They, oh, you know, the geishas cool. they have mm. these cushions on the back, and they have. I think this is all bags. about like perform the performative nature of dressing. It's about mm. like you know, female dressing. So the geisha, that process of like transforming yourself and get yourself dressed up, it's drawing parallels between that and a woman wearing, you know, Park Avenue coat and a big mm -hmm. handbag. It's a similar thing. It's kind of yeah. what you wear to transform yourself into a correct and attractive woman. Or a character. So there are parallels, I think, between. So what we want now is to see John's mood board given this strange piece of language doesn't really reveal. Well, it's three. It's, it's three collection already. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's like Kathy come. I think Kathy think, come home goes yeah, to I runs off Lou and just goes to Tokyo or something. It's a take on women changing character with their style. No, I think yeah. I think it's about just looking at those, the way yeah clothing makes you a woman, which is like, I think quite interesting. This notion that you like become you put on this kind of costume and then that makes you an appropriate female. I think that's quite. Yeah. <laughs> interesting that he's kind of playing with that see the bag seen in 24 you see the back from the back oh yeah the the geisha, and it's little they're not even backpacks they're really bags if you see them from close but they're worn but you know there'll be a wider story with this which is what's interesting is beyond the show notes you know he, he works with these stories you know a lot of the writing about galliano and books by him focus on you know how he would get you know this you know, she went here, she saw that, she left her shoes, mm. she fell in love with it. You know, he needs that story and that narrative to design. So you always want to know beyond kind of the references and hints that we have here, what what the wider story is. The arc know. is always the same though. It's always about a girl running away from a repressive society and mm. going somewhere extraordinary and becoming herself, whether she's, you know, running from the wolves in those great big crinolines of years mm. ago. and. Uh, running from, I don't know, Russia or wherever she was. So this one seems to be running from a, 
I don't know, 1960s housing estate, mm. and it's having a lot of fun in Kyoto. Mm -hmm. But then, <laughs> um, um, 26. Yes. 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 It would have been so um, much fun. <laughs> yes, I wouldn't have put uh, pla planed with classical rigour. <laughs> The it's colour an, is so beautiful. It's an incredible it? collection yeah. because it's very hard to pinpoint. But I like that. That's what why it doing. doesn't make sense what they wrote because they didn't know. Well, the first collection, I think, was quite. It was almost quite obvious in a way, mm. and this is. It's quite impenetrable, and I really mm. like that about it. Like you kind of don't. It's kind of prodery in that way, you know, when you really, really don't know what to say. And I think that's what he's been. John Galeon has been really smart doing Margello is, you know, his Dior collections, they were beautiful, but they were quite obvious in a way, you know, you knew what the theme was, mm. and partly that was because of the set and the music and the whole production, but it was kind of like this wham bam statement, you walked out and you're like, okay, that was you know, the homeless collection, that was the Madame Butterfly collection, and they're very They became obvious. very heavy, didn't really they? Whereas heavy. this, yeah. especially as it's on a plain catwalk. It's and he's so got layers. that wonderful, what's becoming a bit of a signature piece for him, the red, red the plain mm. dress that has a... Uh, extraordinary back detail which that's a, you know that's a selling dress when you're yeah. at Cannes and you've got to walk up that carpet and it takes you 25 minutes and everyone sees you from the back yeah. so that's that's a <laughs> to call that a plain dress wow. well, it was at the front it at was the plain. Front. no not not not, yeah, not what we're seeing in the back color. but yeah. that red thing okay, you know looked yes. almost pinafore like from but in that sense I think that's how he is playing on, on anonymity is by making these collections where you don't know what the story mm. is whether where you don't quite know what he was thinking about because that's kind of it's making it much more private and that feels a little bit Margiela that sense of not quite knowing we, we all know it's John Galliano but we don't know what's on his mind and when you're mm. at Dior you knew what was on his mind you knew what the story was whereas with this he's kind of removed himself can we just see the last look um so I love 31 yeah. that's the you know Amal Clooney goes to an event Kate Blanchett goes to the it's actually yeah. a very commercial dress in its beauty if commercial is that evening mm. circuit you know we have the oscar circuit not so far away that mm. dress will probably pop up and with that one well, i won't Japanese unfortunately because they i wish they were dressing like this at the oscars some like of them will maybe. Well. Like some well. Well. who's going you know, who's going to get on you know they, they, there's going to be some 32, good nominees this time uh, absolutely sellable and wearable dress and yeah. lovely i mean the whole collection i think has this way of being presented which makes it a Galliano for Margiela collection but actually it's very wearable mm. Mm. Uh, but uh, what, what strikes me the most and I'm not a fashion critic so I shouldn't be even talking but um, it's I, I loved it in an extraordinary collection but uh, I don't understand I mean there's three collection in one for me and and I wish someone would explain to but me I think that's the, the meaning of all of this you're not meant to understand it that's what I was kind of very badly trying to explain I think that's your that's what's so exciting about it is mm. I, I don't quite get what's going on at all and I don't get what the stories are and, and it's kind of not just the same with this collection it's the whole trajectory I mean the first one I think you could get it was like you know his take on the masks his take on you know process because the mm -hmm. fact that he let all the twirls come out and it was kind of him showing what he was interested in in the marge and a kind of archive and then since then it's kind of I have no idea really what he's thinking about and what his passions are and what he's excited about and I think that's what's so intriguing Mm. Because it's kind of removing from that conversation of like being like, this season I was looking at, you know, and I Lucian Freud, you know, that kind of yeah. really bang, 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 this collection about this, this collection's about this. It's very kind of removed and you don't really know what's going but on. But I also feel it has this burst of creativity that it's been frustrated for a few years and it's, it's mm. he, has, he has trouble in containing it. I don't know. I, it's, I, the result is beautiful. But so in a way, it's smart no to do a collection that's really diverse because if you think just from a retail perspective, like, you know, the smartest brands, they're dropping things at a certain point. It's, it's not the same anymore that it's like the whole collection arrives and then customers patiently wait for the next collection. Like, you have to constantly be refreshing and putting in new stocks. So actually, if you can do a collection that is like, you know, three collections in one or very distinct ideas, that in retail, that's going to work really well because it means you're always delivering something that feels a little bit new to the shopper. You're not just kind of putting everything out there and then it feels really tired. I think if you can do a diverse collection well, then... Yeah, but it still delivers all at once. It still stays. But a lot of a lot of people aren't doing that anymore. They're working in a way that kind of drip feeds stuff in, which is really interesting. So getting things ready at certain points and then delivering it, particularly if they have their own retail environments. Um, and that's why, you know, so many retailers are working with 
labels to do like exclusives or little capsules exactly. it's to try and keep things always fresh so I think that's interesting should we see the close-ups yeah the bags I'm confused by I just I, I don't know about them I don't I feel mean, I've seen so many yeah. you know, we're so bagged out aren't we do we need any more bags <laughs> the nope. gloves are great though yeah, the gloves are really good. Yeah. But the gloves but are like Marjola. But that's yeah. the only sci-fi thing that is referred yeah. in the last line of the press release. I don't mm. see any other sci-fi. I think the vibe is quite sci-fi. It is that kind of Blade runner -y. At the beginning, yes. I was just thinking that in without kind of talking too much about, you know, why Galliano stopped working for so long, um, in terms of it, this new kind of stage in his career it makes a lot of sense that he would be working in this way to, by a kind of lightly kind of almost teleporting from this 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 kind of character to this one to this you know uh, jumping around um rather than kind of being on this intense wheel of mm. you know this story this story this story this story and mm. and kind of constantly having to move forward which is you know mm. what he talked about you know being so difficult I it's think like there's such a this is kind of like really it's so confident and kind of kind of resisting like the you know he's really saying this he's a des he's an incredible designer and mm. he's gonna keep working and just work in his own uh, it feels like his own way you know mm. to to not now yeah to maybe stop just I think he's resisting those like seasonal obsessions exactly. where you have to completely immerse yourself in something and then do something else. I'm sure that like, there's as much obsessing that goes into this, but you're right, it, it doesn't feel like he's getting kind of like into those like swamped in, by yeah, it. Exactly. it feels much more light and just free and eclectic, sort of, yeah. which is very Marcello when you think about it. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. That's a really good point. That skirt is yeah. beautiful, it's really good. Number nine, mm. yeah, worn by a man. I'm going to try and do my hair like that. It's going to be a complete disaster. <laughs> I'm very excited. You might need to get some kind of pieces that go in there. Yeah. I don't think, even with your hair, I don't think you'll I'll be able to. Yeah, I think they put some, some yeah. helpers. Yeah. It needs to be helped. Maybe I can try. <laughs> it's interesting with 11 because it's like cellophane almost, you know, under this yeah, kind of cricket. It's really cream. weird textures. It comes back on the hair. Yeah. Mm. love that, that sort of 60s. Pack-a-mac hat. Mm. It's gorgeous. Oh. The bags, I kind of agree. I'm with confused. Me, I do with those think bags. the bags are just of a course. commercial thing. They look. Yeah. They're they're a hybrid in between a Birkin and a new Saint Laurent Paris one. Mm. Mm. But aren't we getting to the point that we sort of don't need the bag on the runway anymore? We've had like ten years of models hauling hardware down the runway. I do think he's done a better job than most of making the bags look like they're part of the story because we did spend a, a yeah. fair amount of time trying to work out what the bags were saying you know which with most designers you just be like you just kind of ignore the bag you're like oh mm -hmm. there it is of course it's there. It kind of brings me on to the is other point that I wanted. Or or I don't know. Leather. I wonder oh. if he'll do more you know how in some of the really early Marcella shows you had like there would be a dog on the couch or like a little child or mm. I wonder if he'll start being much more like drawing that. on that history too um, that um, <laughs> bag is interesting because I can't work out does it even go over the shoulder at all or is it literally just tied around the front I think it's tied like you see in the next picture see what I mean yeah it's interesting uh, yeah, that it? does it have yeah. to do with the bag that that yeah it, look, it looks like it doesn't it that because it's not a backpack it's a way to show another bag which well, it's, like, it's almost like a bum bag, but worn on the back, you know, it's really weird, it like straps around <laughs> you. It's really strange. It's very impractical. Really impractical. <laughs> Look at you, it's I'm finding it quite stressful, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? Yeah. It's just a bag, and yeah, it's, it's put there not to look like another bag on the catwalk, I think. So maybe yeah. you would wear it normally, just tied. Yeah, like I think just you just have it tied look, on your shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. Look, they just put the tie. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's just a bag. That yeah. you normally you hold in your Which hand. Which is actually really beautiful. It's That's really thick. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Thick it's, cool. it's, it's very, very gorgeous. beautiful. They did it in the MM6 I, show. They wore does it bags, bags as, as well. um, they wore bags yeah. as kind of bando tops. So it's kind of does he design the, the, the leather goods as well? I don't know. I'm sure he has a hand in it. Yeah, they are really beautiful actually. 
Now, th this number 22 is the front, or well, the kind of side of that red dress. Yeah. So when you saw it was coming towards you, yeah, it looked so almost pinafore-like and very austere, and yet it's got this wonderful Japanese detail of these fighting fish and gold foil happening there. It's interesting, one of the topics that I wanted to talk about was kind of like who we see as the marginal woman, like who wears it, and maybe it's interesting given that we've got the bags, because perhaps that is part of the, the thing, is to make it more of a kind of something that everyone kind of buys into and, and is beyond this kind of, we often talk about like, you know, intellectual women buying it, but obviously they need, they need something that's a bit more kind of open and mass than that. Who, who do we see as marginal shoppers though? I think it's quite wide, isn't it? It's, it's very difficult to pinpoint because if on one side brands owner, they want their brand to be for inverted commas everybody because mm. if it's too niche and too fashionist, mm. then there's no loyalty mm. and there's no market enough. On the other hand, designers like this one, they probably have someone mm. more niche in mind. However, then that's why the accessories usually they 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 widen a mm. little bit the target. I don't know. I think if those if if those images were seen from a wide audience of women, I mean, there are so many dresses that, as mm. Marion was saying, could even end up on the oh, red, yeah, carpet. red carpet. Unfortunately, dresses. I think they won't. But we'll talk about mm. this in March. Yeah. But um, I think you they know will. I think we have yeah. a very. I'm, s I'm I'm going against you here, Mima. I think we've got a very exciting red carpet season coming up. Yeah, because there's some very strong female roles. You know, we're going to have a very hard fought for best actress, best supporting actress in the yeah. BAFTAs and the Oscars. And those, you know, we have these wonderful women now who mm. dress brilliantly. You know, Rooney Mara, Kate Blanchett, Kate Winslet. You know, people who are very good at red carpet dressing. So mm. I'm. Um, Oh, I'm going to I'm going to bet you 20 p. I always I always I'm gonna go out cry there. when it's any even watch the red carpet of the yeah. Grammys. I don't think they're going to be wearing these it shoes. It was the however. most horrendous yeah. thing. So I, I bet you 20 pounds. Oh, so, so sure I, I think the stakes. It's interesting those <laughs> shoes because the fishnets are like over the shoe, the shoe, but then the strap is under the. Over yeah, it's really, really strange. I like the warped nature of that shoe at the back. That yeah. feels quite spacey. And yeah. Going back to what we were talking about. Yeah, because kind of the, like the strap is not linked to the shoe. So it's like a yeah. ankle bracelet. And that's why. Oh, yeah. Um, it's very interesting. I think those things will sell. But those dresses are not difficult to wear. No. No. Even the kimono looks, actually, if you dissect the, the, the styling. Mm. It's, I think it's more wearable than ever, actually. But, mm. you know, it's very difficult to say. I do not know if the... Uh, Galliano era at Margiela is doing well financially, I mean um, commercially, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, no, I don't know either. Mm. I think Margiela, if they're smart, that could be one of those brands that is a bit like Com in the sense where you look at it as a kind of really you know, high, mm. incredible, like the most amazing design, but then the plethora of products is just ginormous. And you think, you know, mm. they've got the perfume, they've got so many accessories, they've got all the little objects, they've got MM6, you think the opportunities are there. It's easier to decode than a comm show yeah. live, isn't it? I mean, commerce yeah. can sometimes be very perplexing, whereas this we can see it, you know, the pieces that you can wear and that can be sold are quite clear. Yeah, completely. So do we like it? I do. I do, yeah. A lot. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think it says about his? We've made quite a lot of, I think, intelligent musings on how it says about what it says about how he wants to work. What else does it suggest to us? Is it kind of a, a slower and um, you know way of designing than Dior? Is that what we think he's doing? Something that's like, oh, I hope so. I mean, that that way of designing. He's a was clever so man. Destructive. He knows mm. who for yeah. he's designing, and also time have changed. We're not mm. in the you know early nineties anymore. It's he shows us as, as he's a great designer, but he also he's also an intelligent person. Yeah. Mm. He's and there isn't this with. huge set and all these things yeah. that must you know just be so exhausting for designers. He he seems to have you know he's he's on his mark, isn't mm. he? Yeah, he's I totally doing agree. well. But he's coming out more and more. Yeah. Mm. Well, should we give him a round of applause to wrap yes. things up? Yes. Yeah.